Hello, my name is Tim Warnock, and it is September 16, 2021, and I am interviewing Mike Milo, and this interview is being conducted for the Legal History Project of the Nashville Bar Association. Good afternoon, Mike. Good afternoon, Tim. Would you please state your full name? William Michael Milam. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Nashville, Baptist Hospital, November 1, 1942. Well, there are not many uh, Nashville natives. Uh, so true. Do you uh, uh, do you have some memories of your gra of your grandparents? Yes, I do. Yeah, uh, my my paternal grandparents were from Parksville. They were farmers. Uh, lived on a farm. Had an outhouse. Uh, the whole nine yards at, at that time. So, and and when my uh, maternal grandparents were. Uh, lived in Nashville, the Rehorn Monument Company on, on Lebanon Road, right across from Mount Olivet Cemetery, uh, was their business, a family business. And uh, so I, I grew up with both farm and, and urban uh, influences. Um, uh, tell us about your parents. Uh, my parents, uh, Herschel Milam, uh, was a uh, well, ultimately, what was a salesman for American Paper and Twine Company. Uh, he had, uh, I, he never went to college, went, met my mother in, in night school at Watkins Institute. And uh, she was a, uh, for most of when she was actually working, was, was a secretary for the uh, one of the education commissioners of the state of Tennessee. Um, uh, when you were growing up, uh, what types of things did you like to do? Oh, it was, it was I guess, pretty typical. I was uh, like outdoor activities for the most part, uh, not having any premonition of video games at that time. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, you know, Played outside most of the day, came in when it got dark, uh, uh, went in for meals, and, and uh, that, was, that was about it. Played baseball and, and football and the, the us usual uh, neighborhood. That it was still a time when you had pickup football and baseball games, uh, which uh, was, was a, a great, it was a kind of a great small town. Uh, I'd, uh, atmosphere. I grew up in Donaldson and it, it, it there was actually uh, open land between Donaldson and Nashville at that time. Uh, so we, we didn't get into town very much. Donaldson was all we needed. So gr gr a great uh, youth as far as I was concerned. Where, where did you go to elementary school? Uh, started at Donaldson Elementary moved to Stanford Elementary when it was opened, and then moved, went back to Donaldson High School. Uh, that was b before they opened uh, the, the, uh, the one on McGavock, whatever, I, uh, McGavock High School, I guess. Did you, uh, uh, when you went to high school, did you continue to play baseball or other sports? I played football, mostly in high school, was manager for the basketball team. Uh, where I first saw Brenda Lee, actually. She was a cheerleader for Maplewood, uh, the, the, the junior high league. And, uh, but, but mostly my focus was football as far as sports is concerned. Did you uh, uh, have a summer job when you were in high school? Oh, yeah. I had jobs both summer and sometime during the school year. I, I think my first real job for somebody not related to me was was uh, at a what I would refer to as a Dairy Queen like uh, it's called Dairy Delight in Donaldson and I worked the, the window as a server and uh, then I worked uh, got was hired by Frank Beller the owner of the Lad and Dad shop the preeminent men's store in Donaldson uh, and I worked there uh, for two or three years, both uh, summer and uh, 
during the school year some, and uh, that ultimately started working construction work as well when I was, a, I guess, a junior in high school in the summers. I continued that through through college most of the time. Where did you go to college? Uh, Middle Tennessee State University. How did you How did you select that school? Uh, actually, the going to college at all was not a tradition in my family. And and after I graduated from high school, I really didn't think much about it until a neighbor <laughs> suggested it uh, that I really needed to consider doing that. And, and uh, uh, some of my friends were going to Middle Tennessee State. So uh, I just, I gravitated there also. And, and it turned out to be a, a great education for me. Uh, I majored in economics and political science. And uh, that kind of started me on the road to uh, liking analytical things, uh, the, the, the process of analysis and, and kind of rooting out the, the truth and things. Did you have any particular teachers or courses that influenced you? Uh, well, one in high school, <laughs> uh, a guy named T Code. I still don't know what the T stood for, uh, but, but he was the one that, that started uh, uh, me challenging the the uh, known or assumed things and, and asking questions about everything that I was told. And then that continued in, in, in college. Uh, Norman Parks was the head of the uh, political science uh, department. And I, I don't know whether he was a lawyer or just respected lawyers, but it basically turned out to be a pre-law course. Uh, and and not that I ever considered at that time that I would join legal profession, but uh, I still enjoyed the, the process, both both in the ec economic area and, and in political science. Did you, uh, did you go straight from college to law school? No, no. I, uh, when I started college, I, uh, it was, of course, a time when draft numbers came up pretty uh, rapidly. So in order to be able to finish college before joining the service, I uh, enlisted in the Navy Reserve and, and remained uh, as an enlisted reserve member throughout my four years of college. And, and after that, I went, of course, to uh, OCS, decided that, that I had two years obligation as an enlisted and would have three as an officer, and the officer sounded a whole lot better to me. Uh, and OCS stands for offer, Officer Candidate oh, no, Officer Candidate School, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but the college <coughs> was a great, uh, as, as it is for everyone. I, yeah, I learned a whole lot more out of class than I did in class uh, and, and social areas and, and uh, student government. I was active in student government and ROTC and uh, ver various uh, activities. And uh, student government was really, I spent most of my, that and a service club that I was uh, president of. Uh, well, president by senior year and a member for the other four years. Uh, so uh, it was a great thing. Of course, a lot of times uh, there were a lot of things happened in the 60s uh, that, that uh, could have changed the course of one's life. Uh, it, it really didn't mind, but uh, the, uh, of course, the uh, at 62, I guess, was the Bay of Pigs. And I remember sitting on the steps of the student union wondering if I was going to be called up uh, or activated. And uh, then, of course, President Kennedy's uh, uh, assassination uh, kind of changed the way we all looked at things. That was uh, 
a, I think a big emotional and social change for us, everyone at that time. Uh, but uh, af after college, after graduating from college, I spent three years in active duty on, in the Navy, uh, mostly uh, home ported on the West Coast. Uh, after after uh, OCS, I had the opportunity to train to be a uh, defense I mean, a prosecution uh, counsel for course marshals. Uh, at that time, uh, at least at that level of course marshal, uh, there were no lawyers required to be involved. Had you already been thinking that you might go to law school? When nope. you had no clue whatsoever. It just sounded interesting to me. And uh, there was some competition. It was, it was a well-known school uh, within, within the Navy and, and uh, sounded like a great, great opportunity. So I, I took it. And uh, so we spent a month, month and a half, maybe I've forgotten how long the course was, but uh, training to, to do courts martial and being trained in military justice, code of military justice. And what was involved in a courts martial? The, uh, at that time, of course, you had, uh, the, I think the lowest uh, was a, a summary courts martial. And, and uh, there, there was a limitation on punishment, but, but basically it was all about uh, prosecuting the, the relatively minor offenses that occur in the military, particularly in the Navy where you come into a home port, I mean, not a home port, but a foreign port, and uh, sailors tend to find themselves in trouble or doing, doing things they shouldn't. So a lot of that is handled by the captain of the ship, either in captain's mass or, or uh, the, the first level of courts martial. And, and I was, uh, at, I started out as a weapons officer, uh, but also moonlighted as, as a uh, defense counsel in, in courts martial and, and some other things. And then when the uh, prevailing or existing legal officer for the ship uh, departed, uh, they selected me to fulfill his billet and so I became legal officer for the aircraft carrier to assist the captain in disciplinary matters and make recommendations for punishment and trial and courts martial or other, other punishment. Did you enjoy that work? I did. It's a lot of responsibility. Uh, and it was, <clears throat> but uh, I, I, again, enjoyed the legal analysis and, and what little I knew then about the MCMJ uh, uh, course uh, code of military justice. And, and uh, but it, I, I enjoyed the activity. And of course, part of my duties were to uh, represent the ship or liaise, liaison with, with local uh, authorities in uh, Hong Kong and Japan and Australia and Thailand and wherever the ship went. So uh, I, that again was great, great experience in dealing with people and, and uh, being accommodating <laughs> to things that, that were new to me. I would imagine that there would be a language barrier that would make the, the work particularly uh, challenging. There was, but surprisingly, <clears throat> of course, there are a lot of people that spoke English that that didn't do so just just to make it more difficult. But <laughs> but uh, English was pretty well accepted and and spoken by mo most of the people that we uh, encountered. But, so uh, do you have any, do you have any cases that uh, that that stand out? Not, not really. Uh, it, that was a time when marijuana was becoming a big problem on board ship. Uh, as you can imagine, watch 
night watches on board ship are pretty boring unless there's some, some activity. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of the sailors tended to enjoy uh, a bit of uh, marijuana while, while they were on, on watch. And, and that was, that was, of course, it, possession was a no-no, but, but using it while on, on active watch duty was, was also a big no-no. So I, 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 maybe a third of, <laughs> of our disciplinary cases revolved around that. Uh, that and fighting were the big, big issues. Uh, How long did you stay in the military? On active duty for like three and a half years, I guess, including uh, OCS and, and the schools. And did you stay in the reserves after you uh, completed your active duty? I did. And uh, I got 21 years act of, of active service, not active duty in and, and uh, retired a, a few years ago as Lieutenant Commander. Very, very impressive. Um, did, did you go to law school when you came out of the Navy? It, that's when I went to law school. And I was, How did you decide to go to law school? Well, I started thinking about it, obviously, as, as legal officer, that, that that might be a, an opportunity for me. My plan was to go to get an MBA. Uh, but then I talked to a lot of people, and particularly the, the captain and the XO of my ship, executive officer, uh, thought that I might have the talent to go to law school. And in fact, the executive officer contacted the Navy and, and actually they made me a, a proposal to stay in uh, the Navy. They would not pay me, but they would promote me through law school uh, to go to law school on the GI Bill and then come back and, and serve for a few years in the Navy. Uh, in, in the JAG Corps, but uh, I didn't, that wasn't attractive to me. I wanted to come back to Nashville or someplace and, and go to law school. So, and, well, and where did you go to law school? I went to law school at Vanderbilt. Um, um, how did you choose Vanderbilt? Well, my mother was a widow. Uh, yes, one of my teenage, or not teenage, but one of my childhood experiences. My, my father and my brother uh, were both drowned in a, on a vacation uh, in, in, in uh, Savannah, Georgia, with a, a fishing trip, which I survived. Uh, and so my mother was a widow, and I felt I needed to be here in Nashville. And obviously, the, the only full-time accredited law school at that time in Nashville was, was Vanderbilt. And I applied to Vanderbilt and, and Duke, and I think UCLA. I took the LSAT at UCLA, uh, but uh, decided on Vanderbilt and they offered me a, a, a little scholarship and, and uh, that with GI Bill and, and working got me, got me through law school. Um, did, did you have any professors that, that were no work? Oh, yeah. The, the, the ones that I think most of my generation remember, Paul Hartman was not only a great professor, but, but he indirectly, or maybe even directly, was responsible for my getting in Vanderbilt because my grades at MTSU were okay, but they weren't, I didn't have a poor old uh, average so but there were two letters in my application file recommendations one from the executive officer of my ship and one from the captain of our ship and Paul Hartman was it was a an active Navy captain in the intelligence corps uh, in an in intelligence unit in Nashville so he knew that those letters didn't come easily uh, and I think he never said, but I, I think, frankly, that those recommendations were what got me into Vanderbilt. Uh, so I had Paul Hartman and, and, of course, John Wade for torts and uh, McCoy, uh, another teacher that made you think about everything and 
anything that came out of your mouth, you had to justify. Uh, great training for a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, they, 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 it was a great faculty and, and, and one that I, uh, I feel fortunate to have had at that time. Well, what year did you graduate? Uh, 1971. Uh, did, did many of your classmates stick around national? Uh, a few. Larry Threlko, uh, Frank Grace. Uh, there are probably some others that I, I can't recall right now. Uh, we were supposed to have our 50, 50th reunion, of course, uh, in October, which has just been moved to 2022. Uh, but uh, most of my friends, uh, not all, but most were uh, veterans that had, like me, who had done service and then went to law school. So it was a good group of us uh, that did that. And it was a uh, great group of friends to have at that time. How did you, uh, how did you like the law school curriculum? I liked it. I liked it. I mean, well, as much as any law student can like it. Uh, it was hard. Uh, even, even then it was hard. I'm sure it's much more difficult now. Uh, but, but uh, it was not so much learning the stuff, but again, learning how to think. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, Paul Hartman was great at that, and as as was uh, McCoy and and others. Uh, uh, thinking like a lawyer is far more. If you know where to find information and can analyze it and think about it correctly, you can be successful. Did you uh, did Did you work while you were in law school? Yes, I did. What did you uh, do? I was the first law clerk ever hired by uh, the, the law firm Barksdale, Wally, Lever, Gilbert, and Frank. Uh, they hired me. The only reason I went there, to the reason they hired me was that I had interviewed with Richard Frank and John Wally as uh, commanders in the Naval Intelligence Unit in Nashville. Uh, of which Paul Hartman was a member. And uh, those they were the only lawyers I knew in Nashville. I lived here all my life. I didn't know a single lawyer. Uh, so uh, I went to them begging for some kind of work that would help sustain me and my new wife at that time. Uh, and uh, they hired me to, as a law clerk. They didn't know what to call it. The, I was basically a gopher for the first couple of years, but then I started working, do, doing all, all the library replacements and maintaining the library and running, running errands and getting to sit in, most importantly, on the discussions at the end of the day that the lawyers and, and some of the staff used to just sit down and have a cocktail at the end of the day and kind of kind of review what, what had gone on and tell stories and that sort of thing. That was the greatest education a lawyer can have, I think. That sounds like it would give, give you a, um, a different perspective than a lot of your classmates oh, yeah. approaching yeah. the coursework. Yeah, uh, we now call those people summer associates. <laughs> <laughs> and probably uh, I paid I them much more like money than you. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, tell us about your family. Uh, family? Uh, I, I was married at, when I went into law school and uh, had a son. Uh, that's my only child. Uh, uh, married again, and uh, of we just are celebrating today, as a matter of fact, our 21st anniversary. Oh, congratulations. And thank you. And uh, we're... Uh, I've got five grandchildren. Uh, we live around uh, in the Warner Park area, just west of Nashville. And uh, uh, fortunately, one of my grandchildren lives with me, uh, with us. And, and the rest of them are about uh, five to eight minutes away uh, in, over in Brentwood. So uh, 
it's, it's great to have family near. We don't have to travel to visit with them. My wife's family is from uh, Louisiana, so we make that trip frequently. But uh, other than that, I, my, my family is here. And of course, her, her two daughters, uh, my stepdaughters, Hannah and Molly, are also here. Well, well, will anybody follow you into the legal profession? No. <laughs> I, I, my, my son decided early on that, that the law was not for him. Uh, I think because of the number of hours I spent in uh, doing it and, and the things that I missed. But of course, he's a partner at Lattimore Black now as an accountant, and he's spending the same hours. Right. Uh, he just handles it better than I did. Uh, works from home more than, of course, we were not able to work from home back in those days, we hardly able to work at the office uh, with no technology. But uh, um, So uh, what do you remember about the, the bar exam and transitioning from law student to lawyer? I, I remember being scared to death by the bar exam and, and just thinking how embarrassed I would be if I didn't pass the first time because I actually had a job that I had been offered by the firm I was working with. And, and uh, I really don't, it's, it's, it's all kind of a blur. Uh, it, it even was at the time, but, but I got through it and, and eventually passed the first time. And Did, uh, do, you, do you remember how you learned that you had passed? Yeah, it was published in the paper, uh, Tennessee, and I think on a Sunday morning. I believe, if my if I remember correctly, and and everybody waited around for the early edition. But if I recall correctly, that didn't get in the early edition, so you had to get a later edition of the Tennessean to see the list. I'm sure it was posted somewhere if you wanted to get, drive to go see it, uh, but it was not available online. Strangely enough, <laughs> it was not online. <laughs> Tell us about uh, the. the early part of your career and what a daily routine was like? Uh, thank you. Was, I was typical for, for new lawyers at that time. I did a little of everything. Uh, whatever the partners wanted done that they didn't want to do, uh, we did. And uh, that was the way I learned how to practice law. Uh, I went to court, believe it or not, uh, I, uh, the real estate, I, I did lots of things when, when the, the law was not so complex and you had people to guide you, uh, look over your shoulder and make sure you did it correctly. And the clients weren't harmed by our learning experience. Uh, and so, uh, John Barksdale was of course a great influence in, in terms of what ethical and, and uh, social position a lawyer should, should uh, represent. Uh, I saw him only once, not wearing a jacket, uh, a suit, uh, his suit. And he was, then he had a vest on. Uh, <laughs> And it was a hundred degrees in our office. The air conditioning had gone off. So he, he finally took off his jacket, but uh, <laughs> he, he was the epitome of, of the, the wise, smart lawyer that I, I thought. Where, where was your office located? We were, I think on the <clears throat> seventh floor of, of a third national bank building corner of fourth and union. Uh, right across the street to the south was the LNC Tower, uh, the only skyscraper in Nashville uh, at that time. Were, were there other law firms uh, in the same building? Yeah, yeah. Up above us uh, was uh, Jim Neal and Aubrey Harwell, uh, and Warfield's firm was in that building, uh, and um, Manir Harrod. There were several in, in that building because it was one of the newer office buildings in the area and uh, there weren't that many downtown so 
or you're you are obviously a very well respected entertainment lawyer. How did you how did you uh, develop your practice from a generalist working for all the lawyers in the firm to uh, the the specialty work that you do today? Well, I first have to admit to loving music and I was actually a uh, drummer in many bands uh, during high school and college and uh, some in the Navy actually. Uh, but I was not talented enough to play major sessions or anything of that nature and knew it, thank God. And I also <laughs> uh, sung, was a singer with uh, a boy group if you will, <laughs> uh, at the time, there were many of them, uh, a lot of the, the Vogues and the freshmen and so forth. But, uh, and I was invited, invited to go to Vegas, uh, to play in the lounge with, with, uh, that, that group and as opposed to going to college and I selected college, uh, might have been a star, but I suspect maybe I made the right decision. Uh, and so I had a predilection, if you will, for, for music and, and creative people. Uh, it just so happened that Dick Frank, uh, Richard Frank, was, was the kind of the preeminent entertainment lawyer in Nashville at that time who kind of achieved that by... Uh, he started, he was an LLM from NYU in tax. So a lot of the entertainers came to him for tax work and through a former partner of his, uh, they developed a reputation for helping out the entertainers in town from Opry and, and, and some others. Roy Orbison was a client, uh, Hank Senior estate was a client and, and, uh, uh, there were several, like he represented A. Cuff Rose, uh, which was obviously the biggest publishing company in Nashville at that time. Uh, one of the bigger in, in, the, in the country, I mean, as far as, as, as the country genre music. Uh, and so just naturally, some of the people I worked for as a, as a very junior lawyer were those entertainment folks. Dick was also uh, general counsel for the Country Music Association and the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. And he asked me to help him with those clients. So I accompanied him on at board meetings, uh, many of which were out of Nashville and got to know a lot of the people on the CMA board. And, and I also represented little while after that, the, the Gospel Music Association uh, and got to know that, that those folks. So uh, it, I, there couldn't have been a better opportunity than Dick gave me for uh, uh, networking and, and getting to know decision makers. Uh, I didn't ever intend and, and I didn't uh, represent or take over any of his clients, except for one, which was a learning experience. Uh, but they recommended me to other people. And as a result of that, uh, other people started coming to me and I got to know managers and other folks. And, and so uh, I guess my first, well, my, the client that I referred to with Dick Frank was, was a guy who who was very talented, but but loved to take shortcuts and loved to live on the edge a little bit, uh, legally and otherwise. So I got great training in damage control, uh, which which proved to be really helpful with in the entertainment industry. Uh, but I guess my first two uh, clients who came directly to me. Uh, one, first one was Ricky Skaggs, uh, when he was getting ready to move from Sugar Hill Records to, to Columbia Records, or what is now Sony. Uh, and then uh, Bassberry and Sims called one day, Frank Burrell, 
and said, look, I got some guys here that, that need some help and they're on RCA records and uh, we have a conflict. Could you see them right now? I said, sure, who are they? He said, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a group of guys. I think they're called Alabama. <laughs> Uh, so they came over to my office, we sat and talked, and I still represent Alabama today, as well as Ricky Skaggs, for that matter. Uh, and but that, that was the beginning, and, and then word gets out, it's a small, small industry. And, and I've always felt like a satisfied and happy client is, is the best marketing any lawyer can do. And um, that OP future horn. So... Uh, I you have your own firm now. Tell us about the, the evolution of uh, coming out of law school and working for the first firm that you first firm you worked for oh, until okay. where you are today. Well, uh, briefly, uh, it started out as Wally, I mean, uh, Barksdale, Wally, Lieber, Gilbert, Frank. Uh, Mr. Barksdale passed away. Uh, there were some other changes. Walter Lieber left. Uh, it became uh, se several names. It ultimately, and I think in 90, 1991, 89, became Gilbert and Milo. Uh, and we had, you know, I don't know, uh, 15, 16, 17 lawyers. And uh, I was the managing partner until I talked Ralph Levy into doing it. And uh, then uh, we merged with Wyatt Tarrick Combs from Louisville. Uh, and Evolved. We moved from downtown to. Oh, I, I didn't, but but uh, they, were, they were moved offices several times, and and I, I couldn't even tell you the year now. But uh, I had become uh, uh, Keith uh, Simmons at uh, Bass had asked me to lunch to help them figure out how to create an entertainment intellectual property section at, at Bass. And we met three or four times with the purpose of my helping him. Uh, and then one day at lunch, he said, wait a minute, he said, what about you and your team? <laughs> and, and I thought about it and, and the timing seemed to be right. Uh, and there'd been a lot of changes, of course, in, in our firm with, with uh, management that was not in Nashville. Uh, so uh, we thought about it and I talked to two or three of my, my team members, uh, other lawyers, and, and we decided to move to Bass Perry and Sims. And, and that continued, I think, uh, we had a great, great relationship and it was a great time in my career to be part of that firm. And, uh, I guess about 2008, something like that, uh, they uh, had a, a, a uh, what do you call the people that come in and analyze law firms and consultant come in anyway. And they decided to kind of pare back and, and focus on their main mission, uh, their, their main strengths. And of course, uh, entertainment was not one of those. And, and, and our practice is just different from a normal law practice because it, it, it's really a practice for very small, closely held businesses that just happen to be in the entertainment business. Uh, so, you know, the co committees approval committees for clients and things like that were, were always a, a, a problem for us all. So uh, we, I talked to Keith and, and we, Bass was just uh, so gracious in uh, helping us start our own firm and, and uh, their support helped us really do that. And it would have been much more difficult otherwise. And, and we still work with Bass on a number of things and use, use them uh, for things that we don't do, which are a lot of things. 
in entertainment, I mean, employment and, and antitrust and all those lawyer, real lawyer things <laughs> that we don't do. Uh, so uh, uh, we started our firm and, and with, it, with uh, David, David Crow, Chris Horsnell, me, uh, uh, and, uh, and Robin Joyce, and then started adding people and Robin left and uh, we, we now have six lawyers uh, who do nothing but entertainment and intellectual property. Uh, and uh, we do some business work, of course, around that. But, but we then engage other specialists, uh, litigators, including your firm, uh, Thank you. My, my go-to uh, call, and and uh, but but we use try to get the best advice for our clients in the areas that we don't cover, uh, which works out well for us and lets us concentrate on what we do pretty well. So, is the plan for you to continue to focus on entertainment law within your firm? Yes, yes, it is. We're looking. Uh, very quietly for a, a seventh lawyer to add. We've got a little bit more on our plate than we can easily handle, and particularly David Crow. So uh, we're going to expand by one lawyer again. We've never we never wanted to be big. Uh, there, I, I learned at Bass that you have to work really hard if you have a bunch of lawyers, because they're hard, hard to manage. Uh, and, and so we've kept it small. Uh, every lawyer we have right now is a partner. We have no associates. Uh, we've structured in a way that everybody is successful based upon what they, what they do, uh, and, and, uh, what they bring in and, and or the work they do, whether they bring it in or not. So uh, it's, it's worked well for us and we continue, expect to continue, I think, in the same vein uh, for the foreseeable future. But where is your office located? Uh, we're at 3310 West End Avenue near the corner of West End and Murphy Road uh, on the, that's the north side of, of West End across the park as you, as you come up to Mur Murphy Road intersection. Um, how would you describe the, uh, the, the, the biggest changes in entertainment law uh, from the time that uh, Mr. Frank was mentoring you uh, through, through the present day? Uh, well, the, inter the changes in entertainment practice in Nashville have been dramatic simply because of the change in ownership and the conglomerate uh, way in which the big entertainment re record companies and management companies and, and uh, agencies work. Uh, and the, the growth or growing up maturation, if you will, of the Nashville offices of those companies. Uh, when I started, uh, all decisions of any note were made in New York or, or LA, uh, even though they had offices in Nashville and they, they had presidents, the, their authority was pretty limited. Uh, that changed dramatically through, uh, I guess, the late 70s and 80s. And, and now uh, they're no, no one is autonomous anymore, but, but the Nashville uh, offices of the major companies uh, pretty much are run locally. And, and of course, with reporting authority to, to, the, to the headquarters. But uh, people like Randy uh, and, 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 and Mike, Mike Dungan at, at Universal, uh, make their own decisions. Uh, Francis Preston was, was, I think, very instrumental in building the reputation of 
Nashville's executives uh, in the entertainment industry uh, to get respect. Uh, sometimes we still have problems, at least lawyers do, getting respect of our peers in LA or New York. Uh, but I think that we probably have, have equal or some often better lawyers in, in this area now, just because of the way the uh, younger lawyers have come up and, and prepared themselves and dedicated themselves to learning the business, which changes every day. But uh, I, I think the change in the industry has changed what we do as lawyers. And now when we have to nego negotiate a record company contract or a, 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 a major publishing contract, uh, probably eight times out of 10, seven times out of 10, we're dealing with an in-house lawyer in Nashville for those companies and, and not New York. Uh, what other changes have you seen in the evolution of the entertainment law community within Nashville? Well, I mean, technology has changed us all. Uh, it also has changed expectations of people. Uh, but uh, I, I think that, the, of course, the number of, of lawyers practicing entertainment law has increased dramatically. Uh, we've had uh, healthy competition for the most part from friends in Atlanta and LA and New York. And if you will notice a lot of firms have opened uh, Nashville offices uh, for that purpose. But uh, I think the main change is just the number and, and the diversity, if you will, of the, of the Nashville Entertainment Bar. It's probably quadrupled uh, in, in the last 15, 20 years. Moving away from the law, uh, I know you've been very active at Vanderbilt, uh, teaching in the law school. Um, tell us about your community involvement. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm not number one a politician. Uh, love politics, but never want to be be one. Uh, but I, I have been involved in in. Uh, I, I'll again, just very fortunate. Uh, but after, right after I graduated from law school, uh, we were in the midst of transitioning to the new copyright law. At that time, uh, the, the uh, Vanderbilt professor who taught copyright uh, went to uh, Emory to, as, as dean, I think. Uh, so, and they had hired a, another lawyer, I mean, a, another teacher to teach copyright law, but for some reason, uh, they asked me to come teach copyright law at Vanderbilt, which forced me to learn and teach both the old law and the new law. And had it not been for that, I'm sure that, that I would not have acquired whatever expertise I have in copyright law which of course is the foundation of entertainment law. Uh, and so that, that teach, teaching really augmented my skills and, and ability to, to help people in, in the area of copyright and, and some related fields. Uh, and uh, other aspects of community involvement uh, mostly revolve around uh, the Nashville arts community uh, worked on the board and then at one time was chairman of the uh, Nashville Arts Count. Well, I've forgotten what the name was now. Uh, we, used, we used to produce summer lights. That was the, the major project each year, summer lights in Nashville, uh, which was... I, I, at least my memories of it were great. Uh, there were always problems and, and issues, but, but uh, for the most part, it, it was something kind of un, unlike anything else because Nashville was special. We had, we had so many musicians and, and artistic people uh, that, that it made our 
festival, if you will, uh, better in quality than many of those cities around us. And uh, so I, I that project on. evolved. Right? I'm sorry. That that project evolved over time. Oh yes, it did, and, and became a major major uh, uh, festival for Nashville to draw draw tourists. Uh, but it eventually went away. There were was other competition uh, and other ways to do that, and and the the kind of the person who led that uh, moved on to something else and it just never quite had the same uh, feel or popularity. So uh, it, it transitioned to other things. Uh, I, I've also been involved with the, uh, uh, the, the merger of the uh, <coughs> uh, Nashville Council Arts Council, National Arts Council, and and the, the what was the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. Uh, I was I helped as, as found the the Volunteer Lawyer for the Arts in Nashville, and and uh, it continues now. The first director left a couple of years ago to do the same thing in California, and uh, but it, it they are, they are very active with, with the Nashville Entrepreneurial Center and, and uh, uh, helping young and developing arts in, in, in all of the genres uh, in, in Nashville. We've got a really booming arts community in Nashville. And I was I'm happy to play a very, very small part in doing that. Well, I'm, I think you underestimate your, your role in having grown uh, the community and the Intellectual property and entertainment bar. Um, do you are you thinking about retirement? Uh, you're looking at it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I'm. I think I'm as retired as I'm going to be for a while. Uh, at uh, I'm se be 79 in November, and uh, I I work a couple of days a week at the office, and I work the rest of the days here in my home home office. Uh, I generally don't have the same uh, level of activity uh, intentionally that, that I used to have, but uh, I still enjoy the people and my friends and the uh, intellectual challenge. And as long as my body and mind hold up uh, and, and I'm, I'm not uh, harming clients in any way, as a result, uh, I intend to tend to continue that. Well, as I um, as I as I told you when we talked a few weeks ago to, to get ready for this, the outline has a blank final question. Um, did you give some thought to the question that you would like to ask yourself? I, I yes, I, I've obviously thought about it a lot, but I'm not sure that there's any capstone question for for this. I. I I'm a big advocate of teaching younger lawyers and teaching them in the way that I was taught by counseling and, and letting them jump in the water, but being there to pull them out and uh, that and, and, and the fact that, that being a lawyer is all about earning the trust of another human being. Uh, and I think as lawyers, we, we really have to be above reproach, at least in our professional lives. Uh, and, and we, I try to associate myself with partners who have the same philosophy. And I think when you do that, integrity, uh, is it covers a lot of area and and it makes you really conscious about how you serve your clients how well you serve them uh, not taking shortcuts and the easy way out of things 
just all, all, all of life values that, that I think are, are fundamental to, to at least my happy life and, and my partners. So, and I frankly, I see that in your firm. I see it in, in some others. Thank you. That's, that's the thing I think we're in danger of losing when we made the change from hourly rates, I mean, from, from billing based upon the National Bar Association recommended rate for a particular job or work to billing on an hourly basis changed. It was a, it was a tsunami change in, in the professionalism of lawyers, I think. And we've always tried to kind of maintain the attitude uh, that, that led us b before that change, re regardless of the hour you worked. And, you know, that's hard to do in a large firm that you, it's the way you manage lawyers have to, but, but that's one reason we've tried to remain small and agile and with, with time to spend with newer lawyers, younger lawyers to, to make sure that they, they get the grounding that they need. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time. The uh, Legal History Project of the National Bar Association is grateful that you uh, were willing to take the time to, to, to be interviewed. This has been a fantastic hour. Um, thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much for even, they, even considering me for this project. It was, it was a treat. Thank you very much. Well, good. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you.